What's the only weekly wrap-up of the top compliance and ethics stories? It is This Week in FCPA with Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, and Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitor. Each week, Tom and Jay highlight 10 stories which caught their collective eye, talk about sports and movies, highlight top podcasts, and preview their upcoming events. Join This Week in FCPA each week for a one-stop review of the week's compliance and ethics highlights. This Week in FCPA is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. First, a word from our sponsor, Affiliated Monitors. Founded in 2004, Affiliated Monitors provides professional, independent integrity monitoring and ethics and compliance assessments nationally and internationally and across almost all industries. With its knowledge of effective ethics and compliance programs and cultures, Affiliated Monitor is respected for its work as the corporate monitor on matters ranging from multinational corporations to small and mid-sized companies and even individuals. Having served in over 750 monitorships, no one has more experience as an independent monitor than the team at Affiliated Monitors. For more information on how an independent monitor can help improve your company's ethics and compliance program, visit our sponsor, Affiliated Monitors at www.affiliatedmonitors.com. In this episode, Jay and I take a deep dive into the Ericsson FCPA enforcement action from a variety of perspectives. We take a look at Jay Clayton backing off his threat to cap whistleblower awards. We look at the director of treasuries and a money laundering calls for Congress to patch corporate transparency legislation. Jay looks at the birth of the Corporate Integrity Monitor. Does corporate governments, does better corporate governance late lead to better corporate agility? We take a look at some problems with the Irish Football Association, CFIUS reports to Congress, how and why you should manage your corporate culture. We ask, we ask, how can you manage risk when your board of directors is overconfidence? And finally, the Patriots are caught cheating again. What should be the penalty? These stories and more on This Week in FCPA. This Week in FCPA is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. Thanks for listening. I know you'll enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, the voice of compliance and the compliance evangelist, back again with Jay Rose and Mr. Monitors for This Week in FCPA, episode 183 for the week ending December 11th, 2019. The Weir number two edition. Erickson uh, came in with a stunning FCPA settlement of its long running enforcement action late last week after we had recorded last week's episode. So we're going to take it up on this week's episode. They are number two on the all time list. Um, Jay's beloved Patriots are embroiled in yet another ethics scandal, cheating. Uh, so we're going to chide Jay about that and get his thoughts on uh, what do you do uh, when you support cheaters. Uh, And we're going to use that as perhaps lessons learned for me going forward with the Astros. So Jay, welcome back. And uh, tell us about the weather in sunny California today. Uh, The weather is fine here. What we are coping with now is there are three or four mountain lions out in the foothills of Simi Valley, and they are Some of them have trackers on them, but I kept seeing all these news vans here yesterday. And the reason why they're here is they're catching these uh, lions. And uh, that means that Latka, the wonder dog, is uh, on hunting season. So when he goes out in the backyard, he cannot go unattended. So uh, you thought you heard it all with fires and mudslides and freeway chases, but now we're worried about mountain lions. Uh, move to a new subdivision, and they're actually uh, we're so far west of Houston that there are coyotes rounding around. And uh, one morning, uh, when I had the dogs out for a walk, uh, their ears perked up, and I looked down at the end of the street and I saw one flash by. So um, I know of whence you speak. Um, Jay, we had just a heck of a week. Uh, as I mentioned, the Erickson settlement, we're going to take up that one in a little bit. Um, uh, by itself. So um, why don't we jump right in with uh, where uh, or what Jay Clayton has or hasn't backed off on. And this article comes to us from Compliance Week from Kyle Brasser. And amid controversy surrounding proposed changes to the SEC's whistleblower program, Chairman Jay Clayton continues to stress 
any adjustments wouldn't include a cap on awards. In 2018, the SEC proposed changes to its whistleblower rules geared towards running the awards application process more efficiently. More, more efficiently. The proposal has still yet to be finalized with a meeting vote on changes in October canceled. As currently worded, the SEC rewards whistleblower whose original information leads to an enforcement action penalty of over a million dollars would receive somewhere between 10 and 30 percent of the fine. The SEC wrote in its proposed changes that the rules would authorize the commission to adjust the award percentage to yield a payout that does not exceed, exceed an amount that is reasonably necessary for large awards and no event would the award be adjusted below 30. Some interpreted this verbiage to mean that the SEC is imposing a $30 million cap. And Clayton says, quote, I can tell you that what our proposal was intended to do was to make it clear how we make these decisions, particularly at the top and bottom end of the spectrum. Clayton said at a hearing, I believe transparency into how the decision is made. So since the beginning of the program under the Dodd-Frank Act in 2011, the SEC has awarded approximately $387 million to 70 individuals. All payments are made through an investor protection fund established by Congress. And finally, Clayton said, personally, I think the program has been extremely beneficial to investors. So I really don't know if this adds any transparency here, but uh, he is still talking out of the side of his mouth. And uh, hopefully that amount to the whistleblowers will not be reduced. So, Jay, next up, we had an interesting article from our colleague, Dylan Tokar, over at the Wall Street Journal Risk and Compliance Journal. Um, I was in New York this week and was able to meet Dylan for the first time. Uh, What a gracious gentleman and individual. But um, he reports on uh, comments made by Kenneth Blanco, the head of the Treasury Department's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, Ken Blanco's, I think, name will be recognized by our listeners as a former uh, DOJer. And um, uh, at a conference, he talked about uh, how American uh, the American laws need to be changed because of the lack of information about who owns and controls businesses in cor- incorporated in the United States is creating a dangerous and widening gap in the country's national security uh, apparatus. Uh, he said the secrecy behind shell companies' businesses ex- exist – only on paper is a clear and present danger. And this is really as strong a language as we have had from government officials about the uh, the need for the change in registration of uh, companies in the United States, a bill that has created, that would create a registry past the House of Representatives. We've had one uh, introduced in the Senate, but of course, Moscow Mitch has uh, decreed that there'll be no legislation come out of the Senate under his watch. So uh, we really need uh, this. Uh, You and I talk about this, I think, a lot from the anti-corruption perspective. But Kenneth Blanco really, I think, uh, hit the nail on the head that this is a security issue. Um, And for those who want the United States to be more secure, uh, we need to uh, move forward and have this legislation passed. Uh, Next up, uh, I'm going to take a look at my uh, Corporate Compliance Insight article from this week. And I continue my exploration of the early days of affiliated monitors. And this week we talk about IPSC, which uh, president and founder of AMI, Vin Ziciani, said the initial model for the independent monitor concept came from special commissions to address improprieties by construction contractors in the building schools in New York City. Out of those commissions arose the concept of independent private sector inspector general, IPSC. And the model was to bring accounting, legal, and engineering skills into the oversight of construction contractors who are about to lose a contract because of some type of violation. The IPSC model was used to provide oversight for these contractors so that buildings that needed to be built could be built with the necessary oversight. For AMI, Deciani envisioned a less intrusive model, more collaborative, and remedial. Yet he noted it would take some time once again to convince all of of the relevant parties, regulators, defense counsel, and companies of the effectiveness of the approach. First, he needed to convince regulators that a truly independent monitor not only had advantages, 
but would successfully remediate underlying deficiencies. Second, he had to convince many government agencies and state oversight boards that they would want to have these licensed companies and persons out of business of the public need for services. And number three, DeCiani needed to convince defense attorneys of the efficiency of the independent monitor model. He said defense attorneys like him, this was an idea that gave them something to negotiate for their clients before the regulators. Under the remedial approach, the recalcitrant party would be required to pay the cost of the independent monitor. When the defense counsel realized that the benefit that an independent monitor could bring to their clients, they became advocates for this series. DeCiani mentioned two others of areas of potential pushbacks. First was around the cost of the monitorship, which we now know is borne completely by the company to be monitored. And second was what he termed as a hesitancy and an initial reluctance of some companies to share documents, information, and even access to speak with employees with a monitor. So uh, that's what we looked at this week, and I hope you'll take a look next week when we're going to look at part three of the series and explore the expansion of independent monitors. Jay, next up, uh, John Roush over at the Dipping Through Geometries blog. It's, It's always fascinating. John really takes a look at things from a worldwide perspective, and he uses a story of just outright financial fraud in the Football Association of Ireland uh, to uh, raise a greater point, which is the need for board oversight. And the the numbers are just stunning. The uh, former CEO left the board, or excuse me, left the organization and uh, on December 6th. And it turns out that the Football Association of Ireland, or the FAI, is $84 million uh, in debt um, after having shown a positive cash flow for the last several years. It seriously overstated its financial positions. Um, it has liabilities of uh, more than $55 million and bank debt of more than uh, $29 million. These are all uh, in euros. Uh, when he departed, the um, former CEO uh, who resigned received a financial settlement of 462,000 euros, including um, um, and a contribution to his pension fund. The chairman of the board, uh, rather, um, um, st- uh, the president of the organization, in addition, stepped down. He had been on the board. The president, uh, one uh, Dolan Conway, said that although he had been on the board for more than 10 years, uh, he had no idea the association's finances were in such bad shape, uh, was unaware of the settlement given to the uh, former CEO, um, and uh, just a, a complete cluster. And really, John, as I indicated, uh, used this as a case study in how the failure to conduct appropriate board oversight of not only senior leadership and the finances, but to maintain effective internal controls can have devastating consequences for an organization. Uh, Even with the new executive leadership and independent directors, the FAI is on a long and hard road uh, to restore its finances. And I suppose the the U.S. equivalent would be Theranos, but uh, the board has a significant role and it's important for the board uh, to remember that and John Roush uses this great example from the Football Association of Ireland uh, to remind us of that. Uh, Jay, I was really intrigued uh, by an article I saw in the Harvard Law School Forum on Corporate Governance equating better or good corporate governance leadership to better corporate agility. What did you take away from that? Thanks, Tom. Uh, This article comes to us from Kenneth Lane, who is the Samuel A. McCullough Professor of Finance at the University of Pittsburgh Katz or Kate's Graduate School of Business. In financial economics literature and corporate governance, uh, this was largely non-existent prior to the 1970s, and this area of research has grown out for the last 40 years. Most of the literature focuses on three dimensions of governments that are relatively easy to measure. Ownership structure, the size and structure of boards, executive compensation, and most of it examines governance and the perspective of the agency theory. In this paper, Kenneth Lane takes a look at a dimension that he wants to call corporate agility. And this basically is an evolutionary perspective. Is agility likely to be a critical determinant of a firm's long-term success and survival? 
uh, between the government and agility is largely unexplored. A large amount of anecdotal evidence suggests that the importance of corporate agility as a determinant of firm success and survival. In addition, the topic of corporate agility has been featured prominently in several recent proxy contests. For example, in the Tryon Partners proxy contest with Procter & Gamble in 2017, it stated that disruptive and existential threats are are impacting the entire consumer packaged industry. Um, Corporate governance, in effect, defines how decision rights are allocated among various stakeholders and in the organization. Insider control boards are inherently bad for outsider shareholders because the insiders can make decisions that benefit themselves at the expense of outside shareholders. However, the cost of transferring specific knowledge from corporate managers to outside directors is likely to inhibit corporate agility. Similarly, dual classes of common stock with different voting rights are often depicted as inherently bad for the outsider. The integration of the corporate agility into the corporate governance literature appears to be a promising area for future research. Although developing a generic measure of agility is challenging, industry studies that focus on industry-specific measures of agility seem tractable. For example, in the retail industry, what is the relationship between governance and the speed of which bricks and mortar firms have adapted to online com- commercial change? So it's a very interesting article. We just touched upon the synopsis here, but in the show notes, we link to the entire paper and we suggest you check it out. Jay, our friend Jim Deloach has another article up on corporate compliance insights. And I know this is something that uh, you guys over at Affiliated Monitors think about uh, and work with quite a lot. So I was really interested to see this. Jim's article is entitled Managing Organizational Culture as an Enterprise Asset. And uh, with with everything writes, Jim writes, you really need to read it. But he points out that uh, a nurture culture in a changing environment, because culture not only means different things to different people, but it it changes and has changed over time. You need to understand and monitor culture, which is, is a message that I know you have articulated uh, multiple times. And then measuring culture is something that companies need to move towards doing uh, be curious enough to probe on culture. In other words, ask questions. And then Jim Lee l- leaves us with questions for senior executives and boards of directors. So uh, it's a great article. I suggest uh, you check it out uh, no matter what your position is uh, in a compliance function uh, or senior leadership or in a business position. Uh, next up, we have something coming to us from NYU's Compliance and Enforcement mm-hmm. blog. Uh, these are key takeaways from the CFIUS annual report to Congress covering the calendar years 2016 and 17. This comes to us from a group of attorneys at um, Simpson and Thatcher, I believe. Yes. So on November 22nd, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, CFIUS, released its annual report to Congress, which includes trends and data on the number and types of transactions reported to the committee during the 2016 and 2017 calendar years. CFIUS is an interagency committee with the statutory mandate to review certain investments into the United States for foreign security, rather for national security concerns. The data and trends included in the report provide key insights into the committee's review process. While the passage of the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act, Act FIRMA of 2018, has made significant changes to CFIUS. Continued upward trend in the number of notices submitted. One clear trend from the data in the report that is likely to accelerate with the implementation of FIRMA is the increasing caseloads for CFIUS. The committee reported 172 notices in 2016, which was a 20% increase over 143 notices in 2015. Uh, According to the report, the total number of notices that were moved to the investigation stage increased in both 2016 and 2017. Despite the increased volume for the committee staff, our experience is that there has been a significant increase in the number of notices being moved to the investigation stage. Based on that information, the attorneys believe that 50% of reported transactions are clearing in the initial review, which is certainly a welcome development. 
In terms of industry sectors, the manufacturing sector and the finance, information and services sector continued to be the subject of the largest number of transactions transactions in 2016 and 2017. Manufacturing sector and finance information services combined to make up more than 80% of the notified transactions. Uh, Countries where the subject of notices uh, included Canada, China, and Japan, and they made up almost half of all notices from 2015 to 2017. In terms of block transactions, the president has the broad statutory authority to issue an order blocking or unwinding a transaction if it poses unresolved national security concerns. Although this authority is broad and final, it is rarely used. Conclusions and final takeaways. As with past reports, this data is helpful in recognizing certain investment trends and shedding light on CFIUS's otherwise opaque and confidential process. Some of these changes particularly the extension of the initial review period to 45 days and the budgetary authority to hire more staff appear already to help reduce the number of notices being sent. Um, And uh, in conclusion, the insights when considering CFIUS risks posed by any particular transaction, but significant changes currently in process pursuant to firmer make pre-transaction CFIUS risk assessments, both more challenging and more importantly than ever. Matt Kelly posted an article over on uh, Navex Global's Ethics and Compliance Matters blog site, and it's entitled Managing Risk When the Board is Overconfident. But the overconfidence comes from a survey from the Institute of Internal Auditors that corporate boards believe their organizations are better at managing key risks than corporate executives do. Um, there are uh, some things that Matt suggests a company can do to get uh, in alliance on these two points. So first, does the board really have the right people in the right structure? Second, does the company have good escalation procedures? Third, does management speak in a unified way about risk? And fourth, does a company have a single trusted source of risk information? So uh, some troubling uh, findings by the uh, IIA um, but uh, there are some answers that can help a company as they move towards uh, actually accurately measuring their risk. So, uh, Tom, are you ready to channel your inner Max Kellerman, or do we want to go into the top story of the day? Well, I'll channel my inner Max, and originally I was really going to let you have it on this Um because it was, uh, I originally thought that uh, the Patriots uh, were intentionally cheating again, uh, but it turns out that I think it may be something less nefarious. So I want to really turn the conversation to, and I, I would say I'm as guilty of this as anyone. Originally, I thought this was an intentional cheating exercise by the Patriots to garner an edge. It turns out that it was it was a violation of the rules, and certainly. Um, uh, um, something that the NFL has uh, made clear a stance against, but I'm not sure it was as nefarious as I thought it was. Um, It may have been a big, simply because of a big disconnect between the uh, business interests of Robert Kraft and his companies and the NFL as uh, the Patriots being one of the business properties owned by Robert Kraft. But it really led me to want to ask you about one uh, reputational issues uh, but more importantly, if you are viewed as a cheater or someone who engages in dodgy business practices, can you make a comeback from that? And how does that color both how the regulators will think of you and the greater business community? And that leads back to my question about uh, reputational issues. So kind of any thoughts on on whether the Patriots were uh, taken at their word, should they have been taken at their word? Have they lost the right to be taken at their word? Uh, and those kinds of questions. Well, thanks for lobbing that softball over me, Tom. <laughs> uh, I think you, you've really nailed it on the nose in terms of um, reputational risk. Even, even before you launched into those kind words, I knew where you were going with this. And uh, I think, uh, you know, once a cheater, always a cheater. And it's once you, you know, you've got your name and you've got your reputation. And there hasn't been one time that uh, 
New England's been in the news. We've had Deflate Gate. We've had Spy Gate. Now we have Do Your Job Gate, if you want to call it. And, uh, you know, I, I think you hit it on, on the head. Uh, reputation is very precious. And once you lose it, as much as you can do, I think that there's always going to be an asterisk. And whether you took steroids or whether you, you know, um, taped footage on the sideline, uh, I think it's very hard to get away from that. And uh, I, I don't know how you do it, but I understand why the league is in uh, uproar over what happened. Uh, let me just tell you, the way this offense works, even if they tape the signals on the sidelines, it's not going to help them. So uh, I, th- I think at the end of the day, uh, you know, it, it's a non-issue right now, but there is a reason why everyone is up in arms. So, Jay, let's now get to the story that's our number one story that we've been saving, and that is the Erickson FCPA enforcement action. This was just a stunning enforcement action coming in at number two on the all-time list, uh, $1.06 billion, uh, in fines and penalties, uh, the second largest dis- disgorgement penalty uh, of all time at uh, uh, 580, I believe, excuse me, 540. Uh, the um, conduct was in multiple countries over a lengthy period as far back as 2000, but more importantly, concentrated from 2013 to 2017. And, and it was really that latter information of uh, conduct into 2016 and 2017, illegal conduct, that really struck me because uh, I, I had thought uh, the memo had gone out about uh, don't pay bribes. Uh, apparently, it didn't get uh, all the way into Erickson. Um, I thought people knew about FCPA enforcement. I thought people knew about FCPA enforcement in the telecom industry. Once again, apparently, Erickson didn't get all of that information. So I was very surprised to see conduct uh, uh, extending that far. The bribery schemes themselves were rather pedestrian. Nevertheless, there was uh, multiple lessons. And I wanted to really visit with you about uh, two or three highlights uh, for you. So I've I've pontificated on for quite some time. What uh, were some of the key points that stood out for you in this massive enforcement action? Well, uh, since we always like to play by the numbers uh, and the treasure trove of the information we have, I want to, first of all, go to um, the FCPA blog. And now we say that Erickson has joined the top 10 list. And if you look at that top 10 list, four out of the top six are telecom companies. So we have Ericsson in at 1.06 billion, uh, Tilia from Sweden at 965 million. We have recently concluded MTS from Russia for 850 million. And then Vimplecom, now known as Vion from the Netherlands at 795 million. So, um, I had the opportunity to listen to several of your podcasts over the week. You and Matt Kelly went into the weeds. You and Mike um, Volkov uh, talked about the duck. And I think that although Houston was the nascent uh, U.S. area of FCPA epicenter of the world and the oil and the extractive industry is the heart of it, I think from what we've seen over the past couple of years is that if I was in the telecom business, I would certainly have the memo now about the fact that it's not appropriate to be paying bribes. So it's uh, very interesting. I think Mike points out that uh, the Nordic countries have some of the lowest ratings in terms of the anti-corruption index. And it's very interesting uh, how uh, even in those countries where there is supposedly a low risk of corruption, uh, this schemes, these schemes in the telecom industry seem to be uh, located. So, Jay, there was a couple of things that uh, I that really stood out for me. And one was something Matt and I uh, had, a, a, as you said, a, a into the weeds, full geek out, 30 minute exploration, which was the failure in internal controls. Uh, I thought there were failures in three categories, ineffective internal controls, lack of internal controls and management override of internal controls. Um, there were uh, uh, numerous red flags presented, which could have been uh, uh, further w- investigated, and it would have uh, undercovered uh, the, the massive bribery schemes. But the second thing was that 
some of the <clears throat> basic technological solutions used in conjunction with business processes are really inter- can be seen as internal control. So a contract management system to provide contracting consistency and allow comparison of contract terms and conditions uh, is a can be seen as a control and can be used as a control. An ERP system such as SAP or Oracle for processing payments is an internal control. And an automated business cycle process uh, program uh, for uh, the entire business cycle is and can be seen as an internal control. And we didn't seem to have those. And it turns out, you know, there's a fair number of, of companies who haven't moved to these automated processes. They're still on spreadsheets or still have uh, hard copy contracts in a uh, document library, physical library. That was kind of point one. Point two was the the conduct of Erickson during the pendency of the investigation led to only receiving a 15% discount under the FCPA corporate enforcement policy. And so I wondered how much did this, their recalcitrant conduct during the investigation hurt them? So I uh, took a look in, in some depth at both the uh, original fine and penalty proposed under the U.S. sentencing guidelines, plus how much credit you get or discount under the corporate enforcement policy. And it turns out that when you are recalcitrant, that you do not cooperate uh, fully and you don't, do not extensively remediate, you're, you're given a double penalty or what I call a double whammy. The first whammy is under the U.S. sentencing guidelines. And this is separate and apart from the corporate enforcement policy. Under the U.S. sentencing guidelines, uh, you can receive credit for cooperation and remediation. If you do not receive that credit, your um, culpability score increases and it increases the multiplier on the base fine or penalty. Um, And second, so that's sort of part one, you're going to get a higher base penalty. And then the discounts available under the FCPA corporate enforcement policy are going to be less because of your conduct. So, uh, I, the way I analyzed it, um, Erickson's conduct cost it about ninety-five million dollars in uh, additional fines and penalties. And one might think that uh, that would uh, uh, be something that, that would garner the attention of not simply compliance officers, but uh, senior executives when they find themselves embroiled in an M- FCPA imbroglio. And uh, finally, the last point was, and I know you have talked about this and written about this numerous times, um, which is that read together the Benchkowski memo and the Evaluation of Corporate Compliance Program's 2019 guidance released by the Criminal Division lay out a roadmap for what a company needs to do to avoid a corporate monitor. And uh, Erickson did not do that. They did not follow that roadmap because they have a three-year monitorship. So that's going to be some additional cost to... um, Erickson. So um, the, I guess one of the key uh, takeaways for me was the uh, what's in the corporate enforcement policy really uh, read together with the sentencing guidelines, read together with the Ben Couch key memo, read together with the 2019 evaluation guidance, really can give you the insight you need to, to actually reduce materially the amount of your fine or penalty. So um, a couple of key lessons. I think you're absolutely spot on, and it's a case I think that uh, we're going to be study, studying for some time, and it's going to resonate uh, for some time uh, because of the information provided in the settlement document. So do we think it's just simple arrogance or it's that they're lazy? Or I mean, $95 million is a significant number here in the Rosen household. I'm sure it would buy some coach purses for the Fox household. So how do you how do you let management off or where the heck was their mind at when this was going down? Well, they didn't self-disclose, which means they were either contacted by or confronted by the Department of Justice and or SEC. So, um, you know, maybe it was cultural. Maybe they felt like the FCPA didn't apply to them. Uh, Maybe the management in place wanted to continue to garner the contracts they were receiving from their corrupt acts. Uh, it's uh, really unknown at this point, and that wasn't spelled out in the settlement documents, but it 
it does point out that this is an extraordinarily serious matter. And if you find yourself in one of these types of cases, um, your costs can materially, if we can bring that accounting word and cross-cultural metaphor into our discussion for compliance officers, increase if you do not follow both the U.S. sentencing guidelines and the corporate enforcement policy. Yeah, so uh, there is a lot of um, scholarship that we link to here. Tom's written a great five-part uh, episode. There's a two-parter from Mike Volkov. We have a couple links to the um, FCPA blog. And as we talked about, uh, Tom and the coolest guy in compliance, Matt Kelly, had a chance to geek out in the weeds. So I'm sure this is something that will not only take us through the end of the year, but we'll be looking at more and more information uh, as this goes through into 2020. And I'm anxious to uh, project myself into the future and see what kind of answers we get at a panel of one of our uh, anti-corruption uh, conferences in the coming year. So, Jay, I wanted to highlight a podcast series that I started uh, about 10 days ago and finished up this week, um, which was the Hughes, Hubbard and Reed um, 2019 FCPA and anti-bribery alert. This is the first of the major law firms uh, year end reports uh, on the FCPA uh for, for its own historical reasons, Hughes Hubbard brings theirs out the week after Thanksgiving. So um, I took the opportunity to do a five-part podcast series highlighting different parts of the uh, bribery alert. On part one, I talked to uh, co-editor Karen Abikoff, excuse me, Kevin Abikoff, who provided an overview of the alert and explained the really cool theme they use uh, each year. Part two was Laura Perkins, uh, podcast fan favorite and former DOJer from the FCPA unit who talked about the FCPA year in a review. Brian Salomon, uh, managing partner in the firm's Paris office, talked about the um, developments in France and anti-corruption. Uh, Mark DeBernardis, once again, another fan favorite from the podcast on um, the FCPA compliance report, talked about developments from multinational uh, development banks and their role in the fight against anti-corruption across the globe. And then finally, in part five, Salim Saud, uh, worked, or rather, um, who's an affiliate firm in uh, in uh, Brazil, talked about developments in Brazil. So check out my five-part series. I link to the um, FCPA uh, and anti-bribery alert and all of the show notes. It's a great resource. I found a lot of great information. Uh, it's, like I said, the first one out annually, so it's uh, always a good read. And uh, I know that there's a lot in there that uh, every compliance practitioner and you just going forward. I'd like to give a shout out to two of our colleagues, um, Mary Shirley and Lisa Fine. They were both recognized this week and they were shortlisted for the Women in Compliance Awards. So uh, that will be taking place in London in the new year. And I also would like to send a shout out to Lisa Beth Lentini Walker, who was also recognized. I'm sure we both know many of folks within this, but specifically, Kudos to Lisa and Mary for their great Women in Compliance podcast, which has really come into its own over the last year. And we know that uh, we're excited to have them on the Compliance Podcast Network with us. So with that, Jay, you want to take us home? Sure. On behalf of Tom Fox, the Compliance Evangelist, and myself, Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitor, we'd like to thank you for joining us for this week in FCPA, episode 183 for the week ending December 11th, 2019, the Wear Number 2 edition. We appreciate you spending time with us and look forward to speaking with you again next week. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of This Week in FCPA. If you have any questions, you can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. You can email Jay at jrosen at affiliatedmonitors.com. We've got a lot of material linked to in the show notes, some great stuff, and uh, so check it all out. I hope you'll join Jay and I again next week where we take up next week's top compliance and ethics stories. This Week in FCPA is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>